In these podcasts, we uncover one chapter after another from the life of the Prophet ﷺ in an attempt to learn about him, love him, and better ourselves through his example. Immersion, mentorship, companionship, and tarbiyah. These are just a few of the things we offer alongside knowledge of the prophetic biography at Sira Intensive. Two weeks dedicated to the study of the life of the Prophet ﷺ and his noble characteristics. So this winter, join me in Dallas, Texas, alongside your classmates from all over the world to learn the story of the life of the best of humanity, the mercy to mankind, the Prophet Muhammad ﷺ. Go to sirahintensive.com to register and for more information. Bismillah walhamdulillah wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillahi wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'een. Inshallah, continuing with our uh, study of the life of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Asiratu Nabawiyya, the prophetic biography. In the um, previous session, we talked about the beginning of the fourth year of Hijrah, the beginning of the fourth year of the Prophet sallallahu residence in the city of Medina. And we talked about specifically a couple of very um, difficult um, in, uh, events uh, from the early part of the fourth year of the life of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and we ended by talking about Ghazwatul Rajia. Now, Ghazwatul Rajia um, basically involved someone deceiving, someone lying to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and to the Muslims and saying that they wanted to take a group of uh, Muslims uh, with them because their tribe was accepting Islam and so they, need, they were in need of some teachers to basically go there and instruct them uh, in Islam and further help spread the message of Islam. The Prophet of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam ended up sending um, six individuals and very tragically of course they deceived them, they lied to them and what ended up occurring, what ended up happening was that about halfway there they ended up you know, turning on them and told them that we've basically come to capture you and to take you to the people of Mecca in the hope of achieving some type of, receiving some type of reward, being able to auction you off to the people of Mecca who basically want to exact some type of personal vengeance or revenge against some of the Muslims due to the losses in the battle of, battles of Badr and Uhud. Um, four of the sahaba, sahaba basically ended up dying at that time, three immediately, another one um, shortly thereafter. And two of the sahaba were taken back to Mecca, they were auctioned off, they were sold to people who were basically bloodthirsty for some type of Muslim blood. And eventually they were publicly executed and a spectacle was made of their death. The reason why I bring this up again over here is we concluded by talking about, you know, the the devotion and dedication of Zayd and Khubayb radiallahu ta'ala anhumah, these two sahaba who were executed in Mecca. And when the news of their uh, fate basically, uh, you know, reached the city of Medina, the munafiqun, the hypocrites, once again showing their true colors, they basically started to mock uh, them and they started to make fun of them and talk about like look ya wayha haula il maftunin alladhina halaku hakada lahum aqamu fi ahlihim wa lahum addu risalata sahibihim that look at these foolish people that they ended up dying like this being publicly executed not nor are they still at home with their family members safe and sound nor were they actually able to deliver any type of a message to anyone what a terrible fate and so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed some ayat um, about this, not just these individuals praising them and their sacrifice, but also just about this entire incident and this entire scenario where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Baqarah, ayah number 204, That there are some people who can say very impressive things to you. There are people who can say very impressive things to you in the life of this world and they will swear, they will make Allah their witness as to what is really within their hearts. They will deny every single claim and proof against them about being hypocrites. الخصام, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, they are adversaries and they are very, um, they are very aggressive adversaries of yours. And then Allah says in ayah number 205, وَإِذَا تَوَلَّى 
when they leave your company, سَعَافِ الْأَرْضِ لِيُفْسِدَ فِيهَا وَيُهْلِكَ الْحَرْثَ وَالنَّسْلِ Then they go about creating, they, they go about in God's earth, trying to wreak havoc in God's earth. They're trying to kill people, they're trying to destroy people's property. وَاللَّهُ لَا يُحِبُ الْفَسَادِ And Allah does not love, Allah does not like this type of, uh, you know, um, this type of corruption and chaos. وَإِذَا قِيلَ لَهُ اتَّقِ اللَّهَ أَخَذَتْهُ الْعِزَّةُ بِالْإِثْمِ فَحَسْبُهُ جَهَنَّمُ وَالْبِئْسَ الْمِهَادِ And when it is said to such a person that fear God, be conscious of Allah, what are you doing? Then at that time, his pride and his arrogance takes him right back to sinning. How dare you say that to me? And their pride and arrogance blocks them from understanding the truth. فَحَسْبُهُ جَهَنَّمُ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says the fire of Jahannam suffices for such a person and it is the worst place anyone can end up. And then finally, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaking about those sahaba who had made the ultimate sacrifice, he says, وَمِنَ النَّاسِ مَنْ يَشْرِي نَفْسَهُ إِبْتِغَاءَ مَرْضَاتِ اللَّهِ وَاللَّهُ رَأُوفٌ بِالْعِبَادِ That from the people there are those who would sacrifice their own lives, if that's what is required in order to seek the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is very, very compassionate with the slaves, with his slaves. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala basically in the Qur'an spoke as to the virtue of these individuals and I wanted to mention this. Now, after this news reached the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and I, and I mentioned about how when Khubayb radiallahu ta'ala anhu was being executed, Abu Sufyan was there kind of overseeing everything and he's the one who had the exchange, the dialogue with, the, uh, with Khubayb radiallahu ta'ala anhu saying that would you trade places with Muhammad? And you could be back home safe and sound with your family. And he said, you don't get it, do you? I wouldn't, I wouldn't trade the Prophet ﷺ being where he is right now, safe and sound, just getting pricked by a thorn on his foot in order for me to be with my family. I would not even trade that. So this news reaches the Prophet ﷺ. And the Prophet ﷺ is very, very upset and very saddened at this type of deception. And even Abu Sufyan, the Prophet ﷺ, expecting a little bit more you know, honor from him in terms of an adversary. He was very upset. On top of that, there's another incident that is mentioned that occurred here in the beginning of the fourth year of Hijrah that Al-Waqidi and Ibn Kathir, some of the historians, they mentioned that Abu Sufyan, he was sitting with some of the, some of the leaders of the Quraysh and he said, ma ahadun yaghtalu Muhammadan? Is there no one here to go and assassinate Muhammad wasallam? Really, nobody? Don't we have a single person that would have what it takes in order to go take him out? فَإِنَّهُ يَمْشِي فِي الْأَسْوَاقِ Because from what I hear in Medina, he walks around in the streets. He's not some guarded, protected like how heads of state are these days, where you can't even look directly at them. He says he's walking about in the streets, he's completely accessible, totally available. Really, is there nobody? So one man who was from the Bedouins, he comes and he says that, إِنْ أَنْتَ قَوَّيْتَنِي خَرَجُوا إِلَيْهِ حَتَّى أَخْتَالَهُ That if you are able to supply me with what I need, then I am willing to go and assassinate him. He said, فَإِنِّي هَادٍ بِالطَّرِيقِ خِرِّيْتٌ He said that I am an expert guide, kind of like a tracker, somebody who knows region very, very well, and I actually serve as a guide for people on the way to different cities, so I know how to get my, I know how to, uh, I know how to get around. And I can find my way anywhere and I can get lost, like I can disappear very, very quickly. And he says at the same time, because I traveled this road so frequently and there's always a lot of thieves and highway robbers and dangerous people, مَعِيَ خِنْجَرْ مِثْلُ خَافِيَةِ النَّسْرِ He says, I keep a dagger on me at all times. And he uses an expression in the Arabic language, مِثْلَ خَافِيَةِ النَّسْرِ Which basically means that it is always hidden. It's like a concealed weapon. You can never tell that I have it on me. But I can pull it out, you know, in a moment, in an instance, and I can stash it back away very quickly. I'm very, very good with a weapon. So Abu Sufyan says, Anta sahibuna. Okay, you're the man for the job. He goes, here's a camel for transportation. Here's a bunch of money as well. And then he says, Itwi amrak. But I need you to keep this on the DL. I need, you to, I need this to be a covert mission. 
So the man says, La amanu an yasma'a hadha ahadun fayanmiyahu ila Muhammad. Because Abu Sufyan says, I don't want the news. We hear that there are some people who have secretly embraced and accepted Islam. I don't want the news to get back to Muhammad that there's somebody coming his way. So the Arabi basically says that La uh, So the Arabi says, "Don't worry, I have this under control." This Arabi was not very well known in Mecca. He was like an outsider, or a Bedouin, so nobody really knew him. So that same night, he departs for the city of Medina, and he travels because he was an expert traveler. He travels for five days straight. Five days straight, non-stop, he just travels, stops minimally. وَصَبَّحَ ظَهْرَ الْحَرَّةِ سُبْحَ سَادِسَةٍ On the sixth morning, he entered into the city of Medina. So he enters into the in city of Medina, and he starts asking people, that where can I find the Prophet So somebody, um, so he arrives at the masjid, and of course the masjid being kind of the center of the city where the Prophet ﷺ could be found and he doesn't find him there so somebody tells him tawajjaha ila Bani Abdul Ashhal he has gone to visit the tribe of Banu Abdul Ashhal to go and you know talk to them and negotiate with them so this arabi this assassin he goes out in the direction of Banu Abdul Ashhal so he gets there he ties up his camel he enters in looking for the Prophet ﷺ and he finds him fi jama'atim min ashabihi. The Prophet ﷺ is sitting in a gathering of his companions. Yuhadithu fi masjidihi. And he's basically talking to the people. So this man enters in and when the Prophet ﷺ sees the man entering in, he says to his companions, Inna hadha rajul yuridu ghadran. This man is not here with good intentions. This man is not here with good intentions. Of course, he's the messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and then of course, just the type of firasa and the type of basira he has. He says this man looks like he's up to no good. Wallahu ha'ilun bainahu wa bainam ayuridhu, but Allah will prevent him from doing what he's here to do. The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam says this man is up to no good, but Allah subhanahu wa taala will prevent him from doing what he wants to achieve. So this man comes and stands at the gathering. And he says, Ayyukum ibn Abdul Muttalib. Which of you is the grandson of Abdul Muttalib? That's the grandfather of the Prophet. So, which of you is the son of Abdul Muttalib? And the Prophet says, Ana ibn Abdul Muttalib. Ana ibn Abdul Muttalib. That I am the son of Abdul Muttalib. I am his grandson. So he goes towards the Prophet. He goes towards him as if he's trying to go and greet him or hug him, you know, kind of embrace him. And of course, he's already talked about, right? I keep my weapon concealed and I can just very quickly take care of business without anyone even realizing what's going on. So he goes towards the Prophet ﷺ, Usayd bin Hudayr. Usayd bin Hudayr is one of the early Muslims of Medina. He was a leader of his tribe as well. And he was a very key uh, factor in Islam coming to Medina and the Prophet ﷺ coming to Medina. And the Prophet ﷺ was able to depend upon him quite a bit for his leadership within the community. He was one of the pillars of the Muslim community in Medina. So Usayd bin Hudayr, he immediately grabs him. And he pulls and he grabs him and he says to him, Tanaha an Rasulullah Get away from the Messenger And what he does is, he, Usayd bin Hudayr, you know, the Medina Muslims themselves, some of them had a lot of experience in warfare and, you know, some of them had, you know, quite a bit of experience with these types of situations. So he immediately, Usayd bin Hudayr, kind of knowing this type of individual, he reaches inside of his clothes and fa'id al khanjar. And he's able to pull out the dagger. He's able to pull out the dagger and he says, Ya Rasulullah hadha ghadir. O Messenger of God, look at him. He was here for a bad reason. فَأُسْقِتَ فِي يَدِ الْأَعْرَابِ And uh, it fell basically from, the, the dagger fell from the hand of the, the Arabi. And he started to scream, Dami, Dami ya Muhammad. Dami, Dami ya Muhammad. He says that I give up, I give up. Don't kill me, don't kill me, O Muhammad. وَأَخَذَ أُسَيْدُ بْنُ حُدَيْرِ يُلَبِّبُهُ Usayd bin Hudayr, right? The Sahaba didn't pray, play when it came to the Prophet ﷺ. So what Usayd bin Hudayr did, يُلَبِّبُهُ تَلْبِيب What he did was he took his own like shawl, he wrapped it around the neck of that man, and then he started to drag him away by the neck. Right? Pulling him away. I mean, this is an assassin. So the Prophet ﷺ stopped Usayd bin Hudayr. He said, stop. He said, usduqni. He looked at the man, straightened the eyes, and he said, tell me the truth. 
All I ask you is that you tell me the truth. Ma anta wa ma akdamaka. Who are you and why are you here? Fain sadaktani nafaaka sidku. If you speak the truth, the truth will benefit you. Wa in kadaptani faqad utli'atu ala ma hamam tabihi. But if you lie to me, guess what? I already know why you were here. I know why you are here. I know generally who you are and why you're here. But I'm going to give you a chance to fess up to what you're doing and why you came. So the Arabi says, فَأَنَا آمِنْ If I tell you the truth, I'll be safe. You grant me protection, immunity. The Prophet ﷺ says, فَأَنْتَ آمِنْ You have safety. You have safety. Right? I, I want to pause here. And I know that I do this quite often in overall in the series that we've been going through. But for every single instance that is quoted from the life of the Prophet ﷺ of the nature of like Ka'b ibn al-Ashraf, right? That is either quoted by Islamophobes or it was you know, alluded to by the Orientalists before them or even some of the militant extremists who again do the same thing by twisting the religion to justify their bloodthirsty agenda, right? For, for the couple of instances that they're able to quote about somebody actually being killed, because that person was very, very problematic, or somebody being killed in the battlefield, or something of that nature. How many instances are there in the life of the Prophet ﷺ? Repeatedly, time and time again we see them. Where the Prophet ﷺ displays mercy, releases. This is an assassin who broke into the private gathering of the Prophet ﷺ and basically laid his hands on the Prophet ﷺ with the intention to assassinate him. And the Prophet ﷺ, as the Sahaba are dragging him away, the Prophet ﷺ didn't have to say or do anything. He could have just looked the other way, the Sahaba would have taken care of things. He didn't have to get his hands dirty. And the Prophet ﷺ stops the situation and tells the man, Fess up and own up to why you're here, what you're doing. And the man says, will you grant me immunity? Fa'ana amin? The Prophet says, fa'anta amin. You're, you're, you're good, don't worry, no one will harm you. فَأَخْبَرَهُ بِخَبْرِ أَبِي سُفْيَانٍ وَمَا جَعَلَ لَهُ So the man ends up telling him, you know, what Abu Sufyan, you know, how Abu Sufyan sent him, and the whole business, and the whole agenda, and everything. فَأَمْرَ بِهِ فَحُبِسَ عِنْدَ أُسَيْدِ بْنِ حُدَيْفِ So the Prophet ﷺ said, okay, now he needs to, I do want to keep him for a while. So he told Usaid bin Hudayd, you are responsible for keeping him. But again told him, don't harm him. But just keep him, hold him till tomorrow. ثُمَّ دَعَى بِهِ مِنَ الْغَدْ Because the Prophet ﷺ said, I need some time to kind of process. So he calls him the next day and he says, فَقَدْ آمَنْتُكَ didn't I promise you immunity? And the man says, yes you did. So the Prophet ﷺ says, فَذْهَبْ حَيْثُ شِئْتْ You are free to go wherever you want to go. Go ahead. Oh, release him? Go. You can go wherever you want. Oh, خَيْنُ لَكَ مِنْ ذَلِكَ Or there is a better option. There is a better option. So the man, very intrigued, he says, مَا هُوَ What is that better option? The Prophet ﷺ says, أَن تَشْهَدَ أَن لَا إِلَهِ لَلَّهُ وَأَنِّي رَسُولُ اللَّهُ That you embrace the fact that there is no one worthy of worship except for Allah and that I am the Messenger of Allah. So the man immediately says, أَشْهَدُ أَن لَا إِلَهِ لَلَّهُ وَأَنَّكَ أَنْتَ رَسُولُ اللَّهُ I bear witness, I embrace the fact that there is no one worthy of worship except for Allah and that you and, with, and only you are the Messenger of God. That no doubt you are the Messenger of God. And then he says, Ya Wallahi Ya Muhammad. Wallahi Ya Muhammad. He says, I swear to God, O Muhammad. He's an Arab, he's a Bedouin, right? So that's how he dresses the Prophet. He says, Ma kuntu afraqu min al rijal. Ma kuntu afraqu min al rijal. That I was not the type of man to fear people. I'm not the kind of man who fears people. I'm a pretty ruthless, fierce individual. My reputation is well known. فَمَا هُوَ إِلَّا أَنْ رَأَيْتُكَ فَذَهَبَ عَقْلِي وَضَعُفَتْ نَفْسِي He says, I swear to God, when I entered into here yesterday and I laid eyes on you, I couldn't think straight anymore and I started to tremble. 
ثم طلعت على ما هممت به مما سبقت مما سبقت به الركبان لم يطلع عليه احد and then you immediately knew why i was here you looked at me and you pointed me out immediately and i passed by so many people on the way here forget about knowing who i was and what i was doing sometimes people wouldn't even notice me like i am so stealthy and so good at what i do i was invisible my entire way here people didn't even see me they didn't even notice me but you spotted me right away and you knew exactly what i was up to فَعَرَفْتُ أَنَّكَ مَمْنُوعٌ وَأَنَّكَ عَلَى حَقٍ And that's when I knew that you have some type of divine protection behind you. And that you are upon the truth. وَأَنَّ حِزْبَ أَبِي سُفْيَانْ حِزْبُ الشَّيْطَانِ And that Abu Sufyan and his whole posse, Abu Sufyan and his entire group, they are the group of shaitan. فَجَعَلَ النَّبِيُّ صَلَّى اللَّهِ عَلَيْهِمْ يَتَبَسَّمْ And the Prophet ﷺ was smiling as he was talking. وَأَقَامَ أَيَّامًا And the man stayed for a few days with the Prophet ﷺ. And he learned how to pray, and he learned the basics of the deen. Then he comes after a few days to the Prophet ﷺ. And ثُمَّ سَأْذَنَ النَّبِيَ صلى الله عليه وسلم فَخَرَجَ مِنْ عِنْدِهِ He sought permission from the Prophet ﷺ that, I, I want to ask you, is it okay if I go? The Prophet ﷺ said, of course, wherever you'd like, whatever you'd like. And the man ended up leaving and the narration says, very interesting, وَلَمْ يُسْمَعْ لَهُ بِذِكْرٍ Nobody ever heard from that man ever again. Nobody ever saw him, nobody ever heard from him ever again. Very, very fascinating. Now, already the execution of Khubayb radiallahu ta'ala anhu was tragic enough. And then on top of that, you have this assassin being hired and being sent by the people of Mecca, and specifically Abu Sufyan. That's when the Prophet ﷺ called two individuals, Amr ibn Umayyah al-Damri and Salama ibn Aslam. He calls both of them and he says, "Ukhruja hatta ta'tiya Abu Sufyan ibn Harb. I want both of you to very quietly go to Mecca. فَإِنَّ صَبْتُ مَا مِنْهُ غِرَّةً فَقْتُلَهُ And if you find the opportunity, the opportunity presents itself, I want you to take out Abu Sufyan. Because he has now made it very, very clear that he will not rest. And he is not interested in peace. And he is relentless, non-stop. He will continue to come after me. He will continue to come after our people. He just will not stop and rest. So I, I want you to go and see if the opportunity presents itself. So Amr radiallahu ta'ala anhu in this camp, this little incident is known as Sariyatu Amr ibn Umayyah al-Damri. So Amr, he says, me and my travel companion, the, the other individual, Salama, we departed from there, and we got very near to Mecca, like on the outskirts of Mecca, and we tied up our camels over there, so that we wouldn't be spotted as obvious travelers. And my companion said to me, he said, Oh Amr, هل لك في أن نأتي مكة فنطوف بالبيت أسبوعا ونصلي ركعتين? He says, look, we're here in Mecca anyways. How about we go to the Kaaba, we do tawaf, we pray to raka'az at the Kaaba. Like it's an opportunity. And Amr says, إِنِّي أَعْرَفُ بِمَكَّةَ مِنَ الْفَرَسِ الْأَبْلَقِ I am more well known and noticeable in the city of Mecca than a black and white horse, which was considered a real rarity. So he says that people will spot me right away. People know me very well. وَإِنَّهُمْ إِنْ رَأُونِي عَرَفُونِي If they see me, they'll know who I am. وَأَنَا أَعْرِفُ أَهْلَ مَكَّةً And I know how the people of Mecca operate. إِنَّهُمْ إِذَا أَمْسَوْ إِنْ فَجَعُوا بِأَفْنِيَتِهِمْ So he says that in the evening time, it is, the part of, it is part of the culture in Mecca that when evening time comes, they basically all go like afternoon time is what he was referring to, that in the afternoon, they all go and they kind of retreat back to their homes, and everybody takes like a little nap, a qaylula, a siesta. Everyone kind of takes a little bit of a nap to get out of the heat for a little while. So he says that, you know, my, my travel companion, Salama, he, was, he didn't listen. فَأَبَا He said, no, 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 no. I'm not interested. He kind of forced us to go. So we went, entered into Mecca, فَطُفْنَا أُسْبُوعًا وَصَلَيْنَا رَكَعَتَيْنَ We did tawaf of the Kaaba and we prayed two rakahs. 
And as I was exiting the haram, kharajtu, falamma kharajtu laqiyani Muawiyah ibn Abi Sufyan, fa'arafani. Muawiyah, the son of Abu Sufyan, radiyallahu ta'ala anhuma, they would both become Muslim, they were not Muslim right now at this time. He says he saw me and he recognized me. And he said, Amr ibn Umayyah? Oh, it's Amr ibn Umayyah. Because they all knew that he was a Muslim and he was close to the Prophet sallallahu So, he went and he told his father, Abu Sufyan. And all of a sudden, فَنَذِرَ bina أَهْلُ Makkah. All of Makkah was put on kind of red alert about us. Right? A notification was put out. Amr ibn Umayyah is here and he's probably here for not, for some, some particular reason. مَا جَاءَ عَمْرٌ فِي خَيْرٍ That he's probably here to take care of something. وَكَانَ عُمَرْ وَكَانَ عَمْرٌ فَاتِكًا فِي الْجَاهِلِيَّةِ And not only that, but Amr bin Umayyah, he was known back in the days of Jahiliyyah of being somebody who you didn't want to mess with. He was a bit of a roughneck back in the days of Jahiliyyah. And that was his reputation. So they knew he was capable of doing whatever he wanted to do. Obviously, being a Muslim, his character and demeanor was very different. But at the same time, they just knew him since Jahiliyyah. So the people of Makkah kind of got together and they started sending out search parties to track them down. Amr and Salama, they, they immediately left Makkah in a hurry. And people sent out search parties in pursuit of them. And they went up into one of the mountains on the outskirts of Makkah. And they um, you know, found a little crevice, a little cave. And they ducked in inside of there and kind of tucked themselves away. And Amr says that we stayed there for a whole night. And they basically kept searching for us all night long. And finally in the morning time, they were kind of, they weren't paying attention to the path that goes back to Medina. So the next day around mid-morning time, Bahwatan, Uthman bin uh, Malik bin Ubaidullah Taymi, one of the Meccans, he was basically, you know, feeding his horse. And I said to my com travel companion, Salama, that if he sees us, he'll notify everybody and then everybody will come right back. Because we were trying to take the path to Medina and everybody was kind of away from there. But just this one man was standing there in, on the way to the path, feeding his horse. And I said, you know, he could cause us a lot of trouble. He just has to scream. And if they hear him screaming, they're all going to come running back. So what do we do? So he says, Amr bin Umayyah says that I came out from the cave at him, like straight away, I just charged him and I, you know, tried to attack him before he could notify anyone. But he fell, he kind of fell out of the way and he screamed and all the people started kind of rushing back in this direction. So he says, I entered back into the cave and I told Salama that don't move, don't even like breathe out loud. Just be very still and very quiet so that they don't find us. So they get there to this man, Uthman bin Malik, and they ask him, you know, I was able to stab him before I ran in. And so they said, who did this to you? And he said, Amr bin Umayyah. And Abu Sufyan who was there, he said, قَدْ عَلِمْنَا أَنَّهُ لَمْ يَأْتِي بِخَيْرٍ We knew that he wasn't here for a good reason. But he was not able to tell them where we were because he ended up breathing his last. Mata, he ended up breathing his last before he could inform them as to where we were. So they got busy looking for us again and they continued to search in the area for us for another two days. And without anything, we stayed tucked away within that little small cave that was out of sight for another two days. Until finally, you know, they moved away from there. And so we came out from the cave trying to you know, make our way back. And Salama, my travel companion, says, Ya Amr, halaka fi Khubayb ibn Adi nunziluhu? He says that, you know, Khubayb, before we leave, we should take his body down. So if you remember from, from the previous session, we talked about how Khubayb, radiallahu ta'ala anhu, was assassinated, publicly executed by the people of Makkah. And the, what they had basically done was, they had kind of, um, they had tied him up to a pole, and that's where they had stabbed him and killed him. And then they left his body hanging from there, where they had tied him up. 
So he says, you know, before we leave, we should dignify our brother and we should bury him. And he says that, Ainahua, where is he? He says that, I know where he is, but the problem is, is that there are some people guarding his body. Just so that any of the even kind of undercover Muslims in Mecca don't try to come at night or at some point of the day and take his body down. So he says, Amr bin Umayyah, again, I told you that he was quite known for being able to uh, take care of himself and, and be able to even take care of other people. So he says, don't worry about it. You take me to where his body is. He was so outraged by this idea that my brother's dead body is just sitting there rotting. And they're, you know, des- they're violating his body like this. That he said, you just take me to his body, anni, and then you get out of my way. I'll take care of it. People guarding him, I got this. So, and he says that, and what you do is you go and you wait by the camel. And if you see that they have somehow, some way overcome, that they're, they're overcoming me, that they're overwhelming me, then you take off. And you make your way back to Medina and you tell the Prophet ﷺ everything that happened here. You make sure he knows. So, and, so they end up going over there and they find the body of uh, Hubayb radiallahu ta'ala anhu tied up still there. And Amr bin Umayyah gets up there and he t- takes his body down and he puts it kind of over his shoulder and he starts carrying him out and it's night time. They wait till night time. So a lot of the people that were supposed to be guarding his body were asleep. And he says, as I was leaving from there, then they, somebody woke up. They woke up. And woke everybody up and they all started running at me. And so I started running. Amr bin Umayyah says to get away from them. And I felt the body of my brother Khubayb slip out of my hands. And he says, فَمَا أَنْسَى وَقَعَهَا دَبْ يَعْنِي صَوْتَهَا He says, till today, he says, I will never forget the sound that his body made when it hit the ground. Like he felt bad. He said, but I had no choice. I tried, what, I tried to do what I could do. And I still remember his body slipping out of my hands and hitting the ground, and I remember the sound that his body made when it hit the ground. But... He says, ثُمَّ أَهَلْتُ عَلَيْهِ التُّرَاب He says, I real quickly, before I turned around, I kicked as much dirt, like just real quickly in half a second, I kicked some dirt onto his body. That my brother, I'm supposed to bury you properly. But let me at least do what I can do in this moment. So I kicked some dirt onto his body. To at least fulfill the right of my brother upon me. And then I took off and they pursued us for a while. And, but we were eventually able to uh, escape from them. Um, he says that as soon as they woke up, my travel companion, Salama, he followed my instructions, which I wanted him to do, and he took off. He was able to make it back to Medina safe and sound, um, and informed the Prophet ﷺ of everything that transpired. I, on the other hand, because they were pursuing me, I had to duck and this and that and try to lose them. And I was trying to figure out my way until I ran into a man um, kind of out in the middle of nowhere. And he had with him some of his animals, sheep and goats. And he was a very, very tall, huge man. And he said that, you know, who are you? And I said, I'm from, and I knew, you know, kind of where he was. And so I said, I'm from Banu Bakr. And he said, I am also from Banu Bakr. So he said that, do you have a place to stay? Do you need a place to stay? And I said, yeah, I really need a place to stay. So he took me home with him. So we get back to his home and we sit down. And I think that, you know, I'm safe and sound. And this is a good place for me to kind of hide out for a little while. And then continue my way back to Medina. But then when we sit down, he starts saying, فَلَسْتُ بِمُسْلِمٍ مَا دُمْتُ حَيًّا وَلَسْتُ أَدْيَنُ دِينَ الْمُسْلِمِينَ He starts saying that I will never ever be a Muslim. And I will never follow the religion of the Muslims. 
And he starts talking about how much he hates the Muslims, how much he wants to kill the Muslims. And that's when, you know, my stomach started to sink that I'm basically stuck here with this man. And so before he could do anything to me, I basically jumped him. And I was able to um, kill him before he killed me. And then I continued my way um, back to the city of Medina. Then as I'm going on my way back to Medina, two individuals end up catching up to me. And they're basically scouts, like bounty hunters that were sent by the people of Quraysh. They were hired and sent by the people of Quraysh to find me and bring me back. So I, when they got close to me, I said, listen, guys, stop. You go your way, I go my way. Leave me alone. Nothing has to happen here. And they kept proceeding towards me. So I started shooting my arrows in their direction. I was able to hit one of them and take one of them out. And then when the other one saw that I had just taken out his, his buddy, you know, he started to try to run away and I grabbed him and I tied him up and I basically took him with me back to Medina. And when I entered back into the city of Medina, he says that I took, I went to the Prophet ﷺ. And by that time, Salama had gone back to Medina and he had told everybody about what had happened and what had transpired. And so when I entered in, people were looking at me almost in shock and dismay that I was back alive against all odds. I finally went to the Prophet ﷺ and as soon as the Prophet ﷺ saw me from a distance, he started to smile. That he was happy that I had survived. And the Prophet ﷺ made dua for me. And he says that Salama had gotten back three days before I had. And so this was the incident basically known as the incident of Amr bin Umayyah al-Damri. And he was able to reach back to Medina and they were able to then ransom the bounty hunter that they had gotten of the Quraysh. They were able to ransom him back to the people of Mecca. Um, and so this was one of the major events that ended up happening and really, you know, showed basically that the people of Mecca were not willing to leave the people of Medina alone. They were not willing to leave the Prophet ﷺ alone and they had not buried the hatchet, but they were very much looking for any and every opportunity. And this will basically lead us to, inshallah, uh, a discussion of one of the most tragic incidents uh, of the life of the Prophet ﷺ and of the Muslim community and that is the incident of Bir Ma'una. The incident of Bir Ma'una which was a very very tragic and bloody incident where many many Muslims uh, were unfortunately tricked and once again massacred. There was a massacre at Bir Ma'una and inshallah we'll be talking about that in the next session. The last thing I'll mention here is that um, just sometimes I kind of uh, mention some of these things. I know that they're a little bit more specific. But Ibn Hisham, when he talks about this particular incident and story, he slightly disagrees with Ibn Ishaq and Al-Waqidi and others. And that is, he says that the man who was, who was on the journey with Amr bin Umayyah al-Damri was not Salama, but rather his name was Jabbar ibn Sakhar. However, the majority of the historians, and Ibn Kathir rahmahullah ta'ala, who usually takes all these incidents into consideration, all the narrations into consideration and kind of reconciles them, he does choose the narrative of Ibn Ishaq and Al-Waqidi and says, no, that the second individual's name was uh, Salama radiallahu ta'ala an. So inshallah, we'll go ahead and stop here. And as I mentioned, inshallah, in the next session, we'll talk about the journey of Bir Ma'una. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us all the ability to practice everything that was said and heard. Subhanallah wa bihamdihi. Subhanakallah wa bihamdik. Nashad wa la ilaha illa anta. Nasakhfiraka wa natubu ilayhi.